I'm Chuck White, uh, president of Salisbury University, and I would very much like to thank uh, David McCreary and Casey Kasser, uh, the SGA and Graduate Student Council for co-hosting this town hall meeting with me. Um, as a reminder, uh, this meeting is being recorded and uh, will be available for playback uh, later on. Um, last year, I committed to communicating more frequently and uh, these town quarterly town halls are just one of the ways that we've attempted to increase the flow of information between students, faculty and staff and university leadership. I also want to commend uh, David and Casey for their leadership on the president's cabinet and on a host of issues that we've been navigating in recent months. Um, David and Casey are uh, some of the main conduits that we have for representing student views and getting those views expressed uh, to the administration. And I commend both of them for doing that uh, many, many times over the past uh, months uh, where we've been dealing with the coronavirus and, and many other issues. There's a lot going on. Uh, and their input, along with that of GSC and SGA, has been instrumental in communicating with students, as well as giving us a better understanding of how decisions are being made and how those decisions will impact members of our campus community. Thank you all for joining, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Uh, I will note that uh, I might call um, on any member of, of my staff uh, for more detailed or specific uh, information related to your questions as they come up in the Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, when you have questions, uh, be sure to post them in the Q&A. And after um, uh, we make some initial remarks, we'll get to your questions. So um, with respect to COVID, um, our guiding philosophy has been to provide the very best SU experience as possible for our students and uh, our employees. And that experience includes in-person opportunities for course instruction and extracurricular activities. But we can only do that if we keep you safe. And uh, during a worldwide pandemic, the safety of our students and employees has to be the top priority. Mask wearing, social distancing, hand hygiene, hygiene, and all of the safety precautions that you've become familiar with are vitally important to slowing the spread of COVID-19. Uh, but the single most fa important factor is human behavior. We have to just do it. And I must say, you have been doing it. Uh, it's great. Our positivity rates are much lower than those uh, of our county, of our state, of our nation. Uh, and uh, that's a great reflection of the dedication that you all have had to keeping each other safe. Um, so, so thank you. Uh, really, our mission uh, depends on everybody buying into this idea and you have bought into it and I am very, very grateful. Um, as far as uh, diversity and inclusion goes, we have made pretty good strides, I think, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, creating a more inclusive campus and that work has not stopped uh, in spite of the pandemic. Right before we had to close our campus last spring, we welcomed Joan Williams as the university's new chief diversity officer. This work to build a stronger, more equitable and inclusive campus cannot and should not fall on the shoulders of just one person. That's not the idea here. But Joan's hiring allowed us to centralize resources and coordinate coordinate efforts that all of us participate in, uh, in this important work. I am proud of the new diversity training that students and employees are undertaking. And I've been impressed with the completion rates and positive feedback uh, that we've been hearing. So thank you for uh, paying attention to that uh, as, as well and, and uh, learning with us. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Casey Kassar, uh, president of the Graduate Student Council. And uh, Casey, you got some opening remarks. Hello. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to be here. I'm just going to give some updates from the Graduate Student Council. 
We are very excited to go into our spring semester with some new ideas on what we could be providing for our graduate students. We're looking to host another collaboration with the Writing Center, um, a fellowship workshop, some finance workshops, as well as um, hoping to work with the Honors College and do a workshop to meet some undergrad who are interested in going to graduate school. Um, other big things, we are trying to figure out some alternatives to bring our graduate students together, um, especially those who are graduating this spring um, with our annual gala. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then another big collaboration between SGA and the Career Center is working on our volunteer center and bringing that back to life with new networking and connections and a lot more opportunities for students to get involved on campus and community. So that is all from the Grad Student Council. And David McCreary, president of SGA. Welcome, David. Thank you, Dr. White. And, and thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for being so uh, impactful uh, on the campus community and in the campus community. Um, and thank you for being so engaged in the campus community as well. Uh, some of the updates and the upcoming things from the Student Government Association um, are the continuation of the Actions Outwards Resolution uh, that resolution uh, was approved and, and passed last semester uh, through the Student Government Association. And in the future and in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll be meeting with the uh, administration uh, as well as other campus leaders um, like the faculty uh, senate uh, to make sure that some of these things that, that all have already been acted on uh, are continuing, continuing to be supported. Um, things like curriculum change, um, things like diversity and inclusion, uh, like Dr. White had mentioned before, uh, and just those things that we can do and build together to make this campus a much more inclusive campus uh, and, and a great campus for, for every seagull and every person in our community. Um, in the same vein as the town, this town hall, uh, the Student Government Association will be hosting town halls uh, once a month, hopefully. Uh, we don't have dates as of yet, but uh, coming next week, we should have those dates set. Uh, they're going to be general town halls, just so we can have a, a better sense of student concerns, uh, student needs, and uh, the student successes that, that we see um, during this crazy time that we're all in. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that we're reaching uh, a, a lot broader uh, student population than just the, the people that, that come to form of the student leaders or, or student organizations. So uh, our general town halls will definitely give us the opportunity to meet with you, uh, to, to hear what you need and what you're concerned about, uh, and then act on those things as we receive them. Um, we have open office hours. Uh, our exec and Senate uh, have open office hours. And I, hopefully I'll be able to share with you all uh, some of the links to our Zoom rooms. Um, along with that, we have uh, open Senate meetings and, and open um open joint session meetings that we've just started this semester. Uh, so you guys can see what we're working on, um, what we're doing and what we're working on in terms of collaboration with administration, uh, as well as the Graduate Student Council. Uh, next week, uh, we have the Black Excellence Series. Uh, this was created by our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Dorian Rogers, uh, and all of the hardworking senators on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, that's gonna be starting on February 10th and information for that will definitely be on our Instagram um, in the coming days and, and definitely next week. So keep an eye out. Uh, there are amazing things still going on on campus and we'll definitely be uh, doing, doing great things as the coming weeks uh, come. Thank you, David. Also uh, joining us uh, in the panelist uh, view is uh, my chief of staff, the incomparable Eli Modlin. <laughs> Eli, do, do you want to say anything as we get started? Um, just thank you, Dr. White, and thanks to all of those that have sent in questions thus far. Um, as a reminder, in addition to the Q&A, you can also send questions via email to stayinformed at salisbury.edu. And I know Dr. White, um, Casey, and David, any questions that we're not able to get to today, we'll still be able to share answers through that, uh, through that email. Okay, thank you, Eli. So we um, are going to take your questions. Uh, there's a Q&A link at the bottom of your page, and um, feel free to type the questions in there. So far, we only have one question, uh, but uh, I'm going to ask David to moderate this, and uh, so take it away, David. 
Yes, sir. Uh, the first question uh, says, as a commuter student that comes to SU and brings my own lunch, uh, now with COVID regulations, there is little to nowhere for me to eat, heat up my own food. Uh, could there possibly be more thought into opening microwaves and a few more areas for eating? Uh, I, I guess I can take the, the lead on this question. Um, it's definitely uh, for commuter students who want you to feel at home because this is your home. Um, so I, I will definitely reach out to our campus enhancement uh, committee so that we can see what the, the regulations are uh, and, and possibly Eli can, can shed a little more light on the, the COVID restrictions, uh, guiding uh, like microwaves and, and uh, common use areas and things like that. But we can definitely work to see where we can add microwaves, where we can add uh, eating uh, areas and uh, seating areas as well, uh, and possibly um, utilizing that commuter lounge um, for that, that specific purpose and, and providing the necessary uh, COVID um, requirements and, and, and uh, PPEs and hand sanitizer and, and cleaning disinfectants as well. So we can make sure that you have that space and you have that availability to, to eat when you, when you come to campus. Great. Thank you, David. <laughs> Dr. White, we did receive some questions ahead of time. Okay. Um, and and if, if it's all right, as we wait for other questions to come in live, um, this question is about the vaccine. Um, and could you shed some light on the vaccine rollout? Who is eligible? How do they get appointments? And what's the availability of the vaccine like right now in Wacomico County? So I'll start, uh, but uh, Eli is... Uh, uh, the person who is at the center of all things COVID, and he'll he'll embellish uh, what I have to say anyway. Um, I think the the availability of a vaccine in Wacomico County is pretty limited uh, at this stage. Uh, I think uh, we have vaccinated fewer than ten thousand people. Um, and a county that has 110,000 uh, residents. So we're uh, less than 10% of the way uh, toward uh, vaccinating everybody. Um, the state has a uh, pyramid uh, approach to uh, prioritiz prioritizing uh, vaccination. And so they're still in phase one. There was phase 1A, 1B, 1C. Uh, and they are still in uh, phase 1C. Uh, there is provision in uh, phase 1C uh, to allow uh, some uh, educators, uh, that would be mostly uh, employees at SU, uh, to, have, to be eligible to be vaccinated. And anyone over 65 uh, is, is also eligible. But uh, the shortage of vaccine makes it a challenge to actually uh, sign up and, and get vaccinated. So um, this process is uh, controlled entirely by the state and by the county, uh, not by SU, but uh, we are partnering with the county to try to inform people um, at the university when they became, become available, uh, when they become eligible for a vaccine. Um, and help them uh, get uh, through, navigate the process of getting an appointment for the vaccine. So uh, I'm afraid that's the, the best uh, that we can do. Uh, Eli, did you have anything to add to that? No, Dr. White, I think you covered it pretty well. If you'll just allow the, the second, uh, second question that came in ahead of time is related. So if you wouldn't mind addressing that one before we start, we get to some of the questions in the chat was, um, is there discussion regarding requiring the COVID-19 vaccine for students, faculty, or staff? Uh, so right now the answer is no. Um, the students are required to get certain types of vaccines, not COVID, um, but uh, those requirements are written into state law. And at this point, there is no state law whatsoever about uh, requiring a vaccine for COVID. And uh, frankly, I don't think there will be. Um, so uh, just as there is no requirement to get a flu vaccine um, every fall, uh, there is also no requirement to get uh, a COVID vaccine. Um, 
This makes it a little bit challenging uh, to ensure that uh, a very high percentage of people at the university uh, get the vaccine because we don't even really have uh, a good way of figuring out um, uh, who, who gets the vaccine and who does not. Um, but uh, I'm encouraged by the uh, apparently very high demand for the vaccine, and uh, we encourage everybody to get vaccinated when they become uh, eligible for the vaccine, and that will help to drive the incidence of the uh, pandemic uh, down to very low rates and uh, keep everything safe for everybody. So um, no, there isn't a requirement, but we're encouraging everybody to get vaccinated. And we have some more questions in the Q&A section. I'll start with the first one. Um, I know there have been parties and large social gatherings. How can I anonymously report these instances? Um, but if you go to, uh, I believe, uh, salisburyuniversity.edu backslash coronavirus, at the bottom on the left-hand side of that page, there is an anonymous reporting um, link that you can uh, go to. Um, I, I would advise you to uh, utilize uh, SUPD as well uh, when necessary, uh, just to make sure we're all trying to comply by, by those guidelines that are keeping everybody safe. Um, it, it's a responsibility of everybody in our campus community to, to abide by these guidelines that, that have been set by not only our university, but the state uh, as well as the, the country that, to make sure that we're not uh, adding on to the problem that we have with coronavirus. Um, so definitely utilize those. And I, uh, Eli, if you could, could you type that or put that link in the, in the chat for everyone to sure. click on? Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, but, but definitely um, if, if you see a problem or, or you see something like that, a, a large gathering, don't, don't, please don't hesitate to, to report those things. Uh, the next question was, I have heard that some students and staff will be tested every two weeks. Uh, how will it be decided who is tested every 14 days versus 30 days? Uh, and I, I believe I can pass that to Eli for, for those. Um, sure. Thanks, David. This is a great question. There will be increased testing uh, this semester. The frequency with which we test um, those coming to campus regularly will increase. Um, but this is subject to um, the University System of Maryland approving our testing plan. Um, right now, it looks like there will be certain uh, student, students, student populations um, that will uh, test as frequently as twice a week. Um, a lot of these students are, are students that are in higher risk activities like your student athletes. Um, and then um, certain other, other groups of students and certain faculty and staff, depending on the frequency with which they're on campus, uh, may be asked to test um, twice a month instead of once every 30 days with the PCR test. So certainly um, when those plans are finalized um, and, and we'll give communications well in advance, um, you'll get that message if you fall into one of those groups. What we're going to do, David, um, is lay out or roll out a new scheduling uh, mechanism so that you don't have to worry about going in and scheduling um, as frequently. You'll be able to set your schedule for the entire semester um, before we put this out. So that's a part of what we're waiting for. We want to make sure that um, everyone that's got to test more frequently um, has the ability to schedule out, plan out, but also change it when needed. Definitely. I, I know that's going to help a lot of people, especially um, with the changes last semester. A, a couple, uh, a, a large portion of people were caught off guard with their testing and scheduling things. So uh, I'm so, so happy that, that we have that now to, to make sure everybody uh, can stay on track and track themselves and things like that. The next question is, uh, will the university allow spectators at outside sporting events in the spring semester? So I'll take that one. Um, the answer is a definite maybe. Uh, so 
For right now, this minute, uh, the answer is no. We're going to rely on live streaming uh, so exclusively for um, our spectators. But um, if uh, good things happen uh, and the rates of positivity in uh, the county and and uh, in the state go down, then we may be in a position to uh, allow fans in the stands in a socially distant way a distanced way uh, in the future. But um, for right now, the answer is no, sorry. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, the next question is, who responds to the compliance reports for classroom violations? Are the deans and chairs notified? Um, so I think the answer to that uh, depends on the nature of the violation. Uh, so um, if the violation is about the behavior of a student, then student affairs uh, will take it. Uh, if, uh, if it's a complaint about a, a faculty member, then absolutely the deans uh, and department chairs uh, will know about it. So it, it just depends on um, the nature of the complaint. Uh, the next question is, we know that varsity athletic programs and club athletic programs are different in terms of talent. However, both organizations want to play their sport uh, just as much as they can, but there seems to be different responses toward handling COVID with the athletic programs. Um, it seems as though there are less restrictions for the varsity athletes and more restrictions for the club sports. Uh, why is there a difference and what are you doing to make sure that varsity athletics abide by the COVID regulations? Well, I think I can uh, address at least part of this um, and uh, Eli, feel free to, to chime in. But um, so there, there have been uh, somewhat greater opportunities for the NCAA uh, sports teams uh, to practice and uh, some of the teams will be playing limited uh, scheduled uh, games against other institutions uh, in this spring. Um, but they actually are subjected to a higher level of scrutiny uh, in terms of testing and uh, compliance uh, with COVID regulations. And so far they have been doing very, very well. The, the incidence of positivity among our uh, NCAA um, sports teams has been very, very low. And, you know, frankly, the people on those teams know that if anybody on the team or any of the coaches test positive, the whole team is going to be shut down for two weeks. Uh, and, and so um, th there has been uh, a, a great deal of uh, compliance requirements imposed uh, on those teams. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. The, the clubs aren't... Uh, uh, subjected to quite as much scrutiny, but they also don't have quite as much freedom uh, to uh, practice. Eli, do you want to add anything to that? I would just add Dr. White and, and, and David and Casey, this is in response to a subsequent question that's come in about regular testing. Um, so the varsity athletes, um, some of them are tested once per week based on their activity and some are tested even three times a week. Um, and, and like the president mentioned, that's one element. Another element of that is that similar to your classroom, uh, the, the varsity sports teams have someone assigned to them. And in, in, in their case, it's a medical professional that can track those that are non-compliant, that, that if they miss their test, they're not allowed to participate in that sport. That's in addition to the athletic trainers being trained in contact tracing, which has actually uh, led to uh, student athletes having a lower positivity rate than the general campus population. So there's an element of increased testing, but as the president mentioned, there's also scrutiny there through um, the rosters and, and the goal net system that's frankly just not uh, possible right now for um, club sports. But I will, I will note that um, Student Affairs and uh, the Office of Club Sports and Recreation have been in touch with the university health team to explore ways that uh, we can increase those activities, but do so safely. The next question, uh, Dr. White, Dr. Odera's work in flourishing the counseling center has had such a positive effect here on campus and her as well as Ms. Sale, uh, Sale's departure is a huge loss 
for us at SU. What would you like to say about the work that they have done uh, and what does their departure mean for the Counseling Center and SU as a whole? Well, I was very, very disappointed uh, to hear about uh, both departures. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great loss for Salisbury University and um, uh, you know, for all of us, uh, for the Counseling Center. Um, so um, overall, I would say that uh, student affairs uh, has been very effective in um, their hiring practices, making sure that we provide opportunity for uh, diversity and inclusion in uh, hiring. And even though we have lost uh, these two very valued members um, of our student affairs team, um, our uh, retention rates for um, uh, Black employees and uh, employees uh, from um, marginalized group in student affairs, uh, our retention rates are actually higher than they are for um, white employees in student affairs. So um, yes, uh, it's a big blow, but we will recover from it uh, and uh, we will continue on and uh, uh, hire great new people for the counseling center and we'll be fine. Definitely. Um, and Dr. Odera's work um, in, in terms of building um, student groups and, and student initiatives and initiatives for, for staff and faculty as well uh, have definitely left an, or will leave an impact um, and, and hopefully will we'll stay um, normalized in, in our, our university. Um, but SGA is, is definitely working uh, with her and her staff to, to make sure that we're uh, addressing uh, mental health, uh, as well as um, the, the importance of the counseling center moving forward. Uh, we have a, a wellness uh, Senate action committee uh, that will definitely be uh, working on those things in terms of initiatives to make sure that we're keeping those things on, on the top of our mind and, and at the forefront uh, of our duties as, as your representatives. And the next question was related to the, the sports question. Uh, can club sports athletes also be tested weekly? Uh, well, in principle, yes, but it's just a matter of where we draw the line. Uh, you know, we have spent millions of dollars on testing, and I don't think we could um, uh, treat every student uh, at the university the same way that we do with um, student athletes. Uh, we, we would have to... Uh, raise a lot of money from somewhere uh, in order to do that. So for right now, we've uh, decided to draw the line where it is. Eli? Dr. White, and, and you're right, and, and the truth is that we could, uh, those, those students would be able to test weekly by scheduling a weekly test. Um, again, it, it just goes back to the point of monitoring it with varsity athletics, because they have a coach and athletic trainer, they have someone that can monitor that similar to the way that a faculty member professor monitors a class roster that we just don't have in place for um, the club sports at this time. And I, I believe along with the, uh, with, with those things, the, um, like you said, the tracking of, of other teams and, and we may be at, at our club sports at SU, we may be doing the right things, but um, the, the tracking of the NCAA uh, as well as other like, health offices uh, around the university, they may not be doing the same thing with their club scores. So it will definitely create a problem with uh, nine players on, on a, uh, a club baseball team from, from another university uh, are, are positive or have, have contacted somebody that was positive and we don't know. And, and you guys go and play your hearts out at a game uh, and then come back uh, positive. It, it would definitely cause some problems. Um, for you guys, as well as our campus community, and it'll definitely be really, really hard to, to make sure that those things are, are um, looked at uh, under a microscope. David, I don't mean to belabor the point, but you've made an excellent one. And that is that the, as, as the president mentioned earlier and what you're alluding to, the NCAA has regulations and guidelines that are set and followed and there are administrators within the NCAA and at each institution making sure that the players are adhering to those. That, that just isn't the type of structure, of course, that um, clubs have. So um, it, it could lead to, um, you know, in, endangering our, our student athletes in the clubs 
and the recreational sports. And then, of course, that translates to the rest of the campus. So you make an excellent point there. Absolutely. And, you know, in terms of um, keeping an eye on uh, COVID compliance, Salisbury University is ahead of almost every other university that I know of. And I know several universities, uh, even on our own athletic conferences, uh, who aren't doing any testing outside of uh, NCAA athletics at all. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's a crazy business and we are well ahead of the game, but uh, our, our main objective is to keep people safe. Definitely. Uh, the, the next question in the Q and A is, when will RSOs get the clear to meet on campus? Um, I, I can take the take that question. Um, so I, I don't believe there are any in-person meetings that are happening on campus, uh, whether it's uh, RSOs, um, administrative meetings or, or anything like that. Um, it's, it's definitely uh, CECL, uh, the Center for Student Involvement and Leadership, uh, their guidelines ha have uh, been pr uh, pretty pretty strict in terms of meeting, um, so I, I don't believe that in the in the near future that we'll be able to meet on campus. Um, it, it, it's just uh, in terms of safety thing um, uh, and, and keeping everybody uh, as socially distance as possible. Um, regular uh, weekly meetings or, or anything like that will definitely have to stay virtual or stay through Zoom. Um, but you are a bit, um, you are allowed. Uh, and you do have the availability to schedule in-person events uh, through the ticket system and through CECL. Um, all you have to do is register the event, um, and get with your point of contact in the CECL office uh, to make sure that you guys uh, have the social distancing guidelines as, as well as uh, sanitization, uh, hand sanitizer, all of those things. Uh, when you have those things, you can definitely have in-person events, but uh, for meetings, just to, to make sure we're not uh, having frequent contact with, with people, um, those are going to be uh, limited for the foreseeable future. So, Casey, you've been pretty quiet. Uh, what's, what's going on with the Graduate Student Council? Um, we just have, we're working on a lot of new ideas to try to bring our graduate students together in events that are both social, but also preparing for the future. Um, we actually had a lovely talk with Dr. Warmack today, and we're looking to put on a financial series to help prepare for finances once you get out in the real world. Um, some other good stuff is we're really working on trying to get graduate representation in a lot of the committees and different aspects on campus. So, of course, graduate students are always welcome to come to our assembly meetings, reach out to me if they have issues or want information. Um, we're just chugging along, trying to make it through this semester with COVID as best as we can. Very good, thank you. Eli, is anything else coming in to uh, stay informed? One last question so far, Dr. White, and it's regarding commencement. Um, can you talk about how commencement planning is going, um, what opportunities there might be for virtual and or in-person um, ceremonies? Sure. Um, so, because the case rates and positivity rates, um, although they're coming down now, they are still near the all-time highs and uh, certainly much higher uh, than they were last spring. Uh, we are uh, still in the process of planning commencement and our initial planning efforts are for uh, a virtual uh, commencement uh, this spring. If we are able to see the positivity rates uh, in our county and our state uh, come down uh, sufficiently uh, during spring semester, then we are open to the possibility of having some in-person uh, components to the, uh, uh, to the commencement activities. But for right now, uh, most of our planning is around uh, virtual activities. And I just wanted to highlight an update from uh, Trisha Smith, who's the director of the Center for Student Involvement and Leadership. Uh, she said Cecil has been working, has been asking for groups to be allowed to meet in person. Uh, they've worked with the health team who felt they have uh, good standards in place and they're just waiting for approval. So uh, definitely keep an eye out for, for those uh, meeting times and meeting spaces uh, when they do get approved. But like I said, as for right now, uh, that all meetings are, are going to have to be virtual uh, through Zoom or through some other apparatus, but 
definitely keep an eye out and, and get with your um, your point of contact and Cecil to to stay on top of those updates and those changes. And there were some more questions in the Q and A. Um, I know you talked about this earlier, but and put the link in the chat for reporting. Um, what about athletes that are renting off campus housing and all the parties they throw? Uh, I've tried SUPD and been told that since they live off campus, there's nothing they can do. Is there anything else to do aside from reporting through the link? It doesn't feel like the parties are actually being deterred. Uh, well, that's, um, that's very concerning. If you, if you report uh, the parties in the link, then student affairs will take action uh, on these. And um, I know of many cases, uh, especially last fall semester, uh, where uh, when there were parties, uh, there was uh, uh, disciplinary action taken against the students and uh, more than a few students were suspended. So um, th the action will be taken uh, we don't always know about every party. Uh, so if you help us by reporting it through the link on uh, that we posted in the chat, uh, then we'll find out about it and student affairs will uh, follow up with it. And Dr. White, I'll just note and I'll put the email address in the link, but one of the elements of that reporting mechanism is that if you choose to be anonymous, that leaves you completely anonymous. So there's no way to get back in touch with you. There's no way to ask questions sometimes needed to get more information. So I'm gonna put an, an email address in the chat uh, as well as a phone number so that if you'd like to report something and still you know, remain somewhat anonymous, you can, but at least it'll give university officials the opportunity to reach out and ask you questions and then get more details um, as needed. And uh, would, would the Dean's office, uh, the, the Dean, I'm sorry, I, I lost the name. <laughs> um, but the Dean's office, would, would that be a resource as well? Uh, if they have uh, specific information uh, about parties or, or numbers or anything, would that be a, a, a way to uh, get that information passed through to administration? The, the conduct office, that's, that's the, the office house. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's another question. Uh, the budgetary impacts that COVID has had on our university are notable. Uh, are there any program uh, budgetary cuts that will take place because of COVID that the student body should be particularly aware of? Uh, and what will be directly impacting students the most? Well, um, so our revenues um, this year are uh, down uh, over our original 2020 budget uh, by something like $30 million, uh, which is a lot. Um, and uh, uh, in response to that, uh, there are many unfilled uh, positions, uh, both faculty and staff positions uh, at the university. Obviously, we're not spending money on travel expenses, and we're spending very little on food. Uh, so there are other savings uh, to be had in the university. So our, our revenues are down, but our expenses are also down as people um, work through uh, rearranging job responsibilities and, and so forth. So um, uh, I would say that uh, generally speaking, we appear to be on track uh, for uh, a balanced budget, even though uh, both our uh, revenues and our expenses are going to be considerably lower this year. Um, so I do not foresee uh, any concerns uh, at this point about uh, um, funding for uh, uh, student organizations uh, at this point. David, do you want to do you want to amplify on that? Definitely. Um, I, I we are definitely uh, in, in constant contact with uh, Dr. Dane Faust. Uh, who's the vice president of student affairs. Um, and, and he, he definitely lets us know. He, he's very open and transparent with us uh, in terms of uh, funding uh, as well as um, budget cuts and, and things like that. Um, we, I don't believe that there are any, um, uh, any budget cuts that are, are planned or, or anything like that, but that's something that, that the SGA uh, is definitely on top of uh, making sure that those those things don't happen. Uh, I believe uh, this Saturday we're, we're actually having a meeting uh, where we're going to talk about fees as well 
uh, as the budgets that, that guide um, student activities uh, as well as student programs. So uh, we'll definitely be giving you all information on that. And that, that'll uh, most likely be the, the theme of our first um, town hall when it does happen is to relay that, that information about fees uh, that we have and that we learn uh, and address the concerns that you have as, student, as a student body uh, and, and as a campus community member uh, about those changes in, in uh, revenue as well uh, as changes in budget. So, I think I'm obliged to say that, um, you know, even though our best projections uh, are that we won't get any draconian cuts, um, things happen uh, and things can always change. Uh, so um, uh, that, that's not a promise, it's a prognostication. David, do you want to... Uh, make a, a, a public service announcement about the uh, SGA forum coming out? Yes, yes, I do. So uh, this this Sunday, uh, we are having our, our monthly SGA forum. Um, it'll definitely be very, very informational. Uh, tell you guys about some of the changes that are happening, um, some of the things that are staying the same from last semester, uh, as well as some of the events that we're doing. And we would love to hear uh, some of the events that you have planned as student organizations and as a student body. Um, we're gonna have Eli come in and answer some questions uh, about COVID-19 uh, and, and we'll definitely have an address from Dr. White as well. Um, but we're, we're definitely looking forward to, to having you there. Um, don't don't shoot the messenger. I did, when we planned the, the forum, we did not realize that it was on Super Bowl Sunday. So we were trying to get you out of there uh, within the hour. So so that everybody can catch the Super Bowl at 6.30. But our, our forum is going to be from 4.30 to 6. Uh, hopefully it ends a little earlier so that we can get you all out of there and, and to your um, Zoom gatherings uh, for the Super Bowl. Uh, but we will definitely have a, a very, very informative uh, meeting, a very, very informative forum, uh, and hope to see you there. So thank you, guys. So the forum is at four o'clock and kickoff isn't until about six o'clock. And right. <laughs> so you've heard all of the hype about Mahomes and Brady and right. take an hour's break from, from the hype <laughs> to come to SGA forum. And uh, <laughs> then we'll get, get you back to the Super Bowl with an hour to spare. <laughs> right, right, definitely. <laughs> well, I haven't seen any other questions come in. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and uh, uh, being with us uh, for this town hall. David, uh, thank you for moderating the questions and uh, for your amazing leadership um, during what is undoubtedly the most difficult year in memory. Casey, thank you for your uh, service and commitment uh, in uh, leading our graduate student uh, uh, council organization. Uh, we appreciate uh, both of you participating in president's uh, cabinet and uh, the, the voice uh, that you express for all of our students. Eli, thanks for being here to um, shed light on uh, some of the issues that we weren't able to answer completely. And uh, we will see you all um, at the SGA Forum on Sunday. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Bye. day. Stay safe.